Hello, friends, dear ones. Thank you so much for being here. I know that life is chaos outside. The world is a swirling tempest. Rarely can we find steady grounding beneath ourselves. Rarely can we find just a piece of moment or a piece of calm. And that's what I would really invite you to do today. Pour yourself a libation, something to refresh your body, refresh your spirits. Take a moment to breathe, to relax, to settle in, to know that despite the whirling mist outside, that there is something beautiful, something holy, something deep in your core that you can reach out to, to hold and water it, feed that beautiful core, that beautiful nature inside of you. Embrace the truly unique self that you are and know that we will never still the chaos outside. We will never fully still the chaos inside either, but we will learn to ride the storm, learn to ride these waves within ourselves, and we can take that energy and learn to ride the chaos outside and learn to bend and shape it and turn it to something that can feed us all. So please, for a few moments today, take a minute to sit back, relax, and feed your soul. And ground and settle as we welcome into this just brief moment in time together. Welcome. Today I want to talk a little bit about where this fiery fox of sacred mischief comes from. You know, other than me being a foxy babe, because you're a foxy babe too. Who isn't? You're beautiful. We're all beautiful. We all have a little bit of trouble. We've all got that fox inside of us. I love trickster stories and myths. And the god that I worship is definitely a trickster, a vixen deity that is viscerally real and constantly with me. A few years ago, I served as a chaplain in a hospital. It was through a program called CPE, Clinical Pastoral Education. This is a period when people on the path to becoming ministers take an internship at a hospital or other clinical setting. We're given no prep, and unleashed on an unwitting population to provide pastoral care and spiritual presence in the heart of people's greatest misfortunes and struggles. And these poor people have no idea that this is some new, someone new to chaplaincy, someone just showing up to be with them. We as chaplains just have to trust that our desire to be present and whatever spiritual preparation we have means that we will let the divine energies flow through us and that what is needed can be and will be provided. On one of my first shifts, I responded to a code. It was an emergency that a life was a pen potentially about to end. So I dropped everything and rushed to the room in question. When I got there, people were in the midst of a chaotic scene. The medical staff asked me to wait outside and pray by the door. There wasn't really enough room inside for everyone to be there and they didn't want a bumbling chaplain just to be in the way. So I held my vigil outside. I was not sure what was happening inside, but I practiced my presence and I prayed that everything would go as smoothly as possible. It was my first emergency in the hospital and I really had no idea what the process was, so I just tried to be ready, tried to be there. And after a few minutes, the medical team left and one of the nurses was in tears. The patient had passed away. I was no stranger to losing loved ones, but I had never stood five feet away from a dying person before either. I offered to talk to the nurse, but they didn't really want to talk to me. Who was I, really? And the supervisor said that it was covered, but asked if I would stay just in case anyone wanted to talk to a chaplain or to pray together. So I remained until that nurse was allowed to go home for the rest of their shift. It was their first time losing a patient. The patient that was lost had a DNR order, do not resuscitate, and otherwise could have been brought back pretty easily, but doing so would have violated the patient's autonomy and wishes. The situation hit the team really hard. They had to watch someone die that they knew they could save, but if they had saved them, quote unquote saved them, they would have crossed a major boundary of the person in their care. They would have ignored their wishes and imposed their own forced life when life was ending. 
It was a hard situation to watch. It was hard to feel. And once that vibe had settled back down to the routine of the hospital and people went back to caring for other patients, back to doing what they did best, my prayerful vigil ended and I went down to the hospital chapel. That was perhaps, though, to me the strangest thing of it all, how quickly it all could just move back from stunned shock to business as usual, from despair to just getting on with our days. And I sat there in that empty chattel, chapel and I began to shake and cry. I dropped the mantle of being there for others and focused on my own feelings my own heart for seeing just how shaken that one nurse was, thinking about how fragile life is, how hard it is to put ourselves aside to honor other people. I mean, we could have saved that person, they could have saved that person, but, but that's even the wrong question because we have to respect the wishes of others. We can't assume what we think is saving another person is anything other than just imposing our will on them. I mean, fucking Jesus, it's a lot. I looked up in prayer and was saying, what the hell, God? What the hell? What the hell? Now, as I was looking up, we come to the real reason for the fox image, because I felt or saw or knew that there was a presence with me, and my imagination began projecting onto that presence to give me some sort of anchor to deal with, something I could conceive of and wrestle with. And the image, this presence I felt, it was this Cheshire cat, smile and grin, a toothy carnivorous smile floating above me and laughing. The presence I felt was more canine than cat, but it was the teeth and the laughter that really sat with me. From shaking and grief, I then burst out laughing too. I looked at this presence laughing at me and shouted, That's right, you're an asshole. And I just kept laughing for a moment. And honestly, thank goodness there was no one else in the chapel. Who wants to see a chaplain crying and then laughing and then yelling that God's an asshole? That's not exactly peaceful to a lot of people. But the laughter got me to my peace. For there are assholes and then there are assholes. And this was the type that's still a friend, blunt, joke-telling, but not allowing the punches of life to be pulled either. Not the type of ass to be there to be a jerk, but just a candid, blunt friend. And what I read into that message, into that laughter, was that you know that people die in tragic situations. You know this happens all the time. And you, Zebulon, chose to be in a position we are on the front line of when crisis and tragedy occurs. And now that you've chosen to be here, how can you be shocked and allow your worldview to collapse when the inevitable happens, when the likely happens, when what you're literally in your job description happens? Like, just get over yourself for a moment, buddy. Death's a part of life. It's sad, but it happens. And if you don't want to be here, you don't have to be. You're allowed to leave. I didn't feel that it was a shameful message for feeling grief. Of course we grieve. Death is sad. It's hard. But it happens. It especially happens in hospitals. We can honor the grief, but we also move into the role that it happens, as everyone else was demonstrating. You take time to notice how sad it is. You take time to feel it. But then you allow the rhythms of life to continue. After my laughter fit, after yelling at God, I went back to work, ready to do the rest of my rounds. And then when I got back home, I made sure that I had an appointment with my spiritual director and my spiritual support, so I did not have to carry it alone. I got to process it with someone else. I got to be there, I got to feel what I needed to feel, and then I went to find my own support. It's what we have to do. And that's one of the reasons we do this chaplaincy training because there's really no other way to test or to make sure that everyone gets the opportunity to test to see if they have this personal and spiritual resources to balance presence at that moment, care for others in a crisis, and then the time after the crisis to attend to ourselves, to patch ourselves up, and then go back to caring for others. 
making that big step to also make sure that we're not just white knuckling it and burying it alone, but that we know how to seek our own spiritual care and our own support. Spiritual work, you see, it requires the constant shifting of putting ourselves aside, attending to ourselves, and allowing ourselves to be vulnerable to the right people. All of this so we can be closer to the presence of God and help model that presence for others in need. We can read about it, but damn, you just need to experience it. Now, the fault behind the chaplaincy training is that it assumes that we're not getting that training elsewhere in this world, but I don't think that's true. Most of the people who come to sacred mischief know grief, know loss, know presence so well. Life has already thrown us into the deep end to see if we will sink or swim, and so many of us are just barely managing to wade and tread water. But there are resources, and there is hope. And that canine grin, though, keeps coming back to me. You see, I love trickster tales. I first fell in love with indigenous stories about Coyote and his delightful pranks. But that smiling grin, I really couldn't take Coyote as my emblem. I've read his stories, but I'm not intimately connected with the traditions that tell those stories that believe in that worldview. That laughter though is still such a source of strength. It gets me through, it gets me going to know that the divine is there with me feeling my pain and then laughing at just the freaking chaos of it all. Foxes, however, are the tricksters of my ancestors from the British Isles. In addition to that folklore, I grew up searching for foxes. Anytime I saw one, it was a special moment. I'd get super excited and race to tell everyone. They always seem to pop up, these foxes, in the most interesting places. Deep in the woods, in suburban shrubbery, in the heart of cities, they're pesky and you can't keep them out. And people try. I love the magic, the wildness, and the familiarity of these troublesome victims. Victims. Jesus. Vixens. I love the familiarity of these trouble troublesome vixens. And when I pray now, when I'm in the heart of it, and I pray and seek that solace, seek some comfort, it's foxes I seek still. I remember that grin, that laugh, and the love behind it. Let's take a moment to pray. Ever present God, you really are an asshole. The world is burning and you do not let us look away. It's unpleasant, it sucks, people are suffering, and you won't let us pretend that everything is fine. You want us to be caregivers, open to the pain, open to the sorrow. That lift is so heavy, can't we numb ourselves? Instead, it would be so easy to turn away. And this is how hard this is for us. How hard must it be for you? You are always there. You are with everyone. You feel every blow. You grieve every loss. What keeps you going? Keeps you open. Please, please show us. The world is burning. The world is burning. But may... Your fire, keep the numbness of despair at bay. Keep us warm. Keep us going. Please help us to not turn away. Help us feel the spark of life going on. Even in times of loss, we can laugh. Something can break through. Help. Help us feel that spark. Show us something can break through, and at the very least, continue to laugh with us. Amen. Thank you, my friends. Thank you for this time with us. Please finish your refreshment. Take that extra moment to settle yourself before going back into the chaos and going back into the storm. May you know that there's always a presence with you laughing and smiling even in the hardest times, something you can rely on, someone you can rely on, for a laugh, for a cheer, for a toast. May you be well.